Welcome to the Artist Work Ethic Podcast. I'm Mike Pilak. I'm a screenwriter and filmmaker who's always looking to maximize my time and potential as I work to break in. In this podcast, I talk to artists of all kinds who have seen success in their fields about their process, habits, and work ethic. Today on the show is Ian Mackay. Ian is an iconic musician and record label owner. He's best known as the co-founder and owner of Discord Records, a Washington DC based record label, and the frontman of hardcore punk band Minor Threat and post-hardcore band Fugazi. A couple quick things before we jump into the episode. I've talked in the past about myself working on breaking into screenwriting. Please check out blackoilfilms.com slash screenwriting. There you can check out some of the screenplays I've written. I have the first 10 pages of each one uploaded, but feel free to email me at theartistsworkethicpodcast at gmail.com, and I'd be happy to send you a full script if you're interested in reading. The script I want to highlight today is a feature drama called Stay What You Are. Stay What You Are is about a workaholic, former punk rocker who desperately attempts to relive his rock and roll glory days through his daughter's 10th birthday party, while his marriage and career hang in the balance. Last thing before we get into the episode, I would love anyone listening to subscribe, rate, and review the Artist's Work Ethic podcast wherever you listen to podcasts. It really helps us put the show out there for more people to listen to. All right, Ian, thank you so much for coming on with me today. No problem. Happy to have a chat. So through punk rock, we both come from a DIY or a DIY influenced background. DIY has really informed my life and the way I work on things. How would you say that DIY and that ethic contributed to or informed your work ethic throughout the years? Like DIY wasn't a, it wasn't a, a named thing for me. So I, it wasn't like an ethic that I was like, that seemed like a good ethic to be a part of. <laughs> that wasn't, that's not how I approached it. I think that we, and by we, I mean, I'll say specifically discord, like Jeff Nelson and me and other people who are, we saw it as the art, art of necessity. You know, we're from Washington, D.C., we got into punk rock. We wanted to be in bands. None of us were real musicians. Washington didn't have a particularly thriving like music scene. And there was music here for sure. There were cool bands, but they were very regional, like very local, and also um, mostly kind of played in bars. And they were either part of like the, an art crowd who were really, again, these are people who I admired and were inspirational to me. Or there are people who are really trying to make it a career. and But at that time, in the 70s, late 70s, certainly, the basic trajectory was that you would build up some momentum, momentum playing here. And then if you started to get some traction, you would move to New York, right? Because New York is where, that's where the music business exists. I mean, you grew up in Jersey. So what town, where did you grow up? I grew up uh, in West Milford, which is a uh, kind of out in the middle of nowhere, and then most recently lived in Jersey City for a while. Was south sent down? Is it down south or like uh, northwest? So kind of oh, like so you're out past like Paramus and all that stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Further out than that. Yeah. Right. So, but I'm sure you had friends who were like, "I want to do this, so I have to move to New York." Sure. Same for me. Yeah, but I think that. First off, I'm a fifth generation Washingtonian. My mom was a really serious Washingtonian. And so I I had a bit of a chip on my shoulder about New York. Um, I couldn't understand why everybody wanted to leave because this is, this is our town. You know, this is, I'm talking about even before music came into the picture. People are like, I can't wait to get out of school so I can move to New York. But I didn't want to go anywhere. My whole family was here. My people were, all my friends were here. So then when I got into punk rock, there was a, a lot of pressure to move to New York, partially because the music business was there, but also because some people felt that punk could only exist in New York City. That would, it's the only legitimate punk at that time. There were a few things that kind of stuck in my craw about that. One is that the, what was happening within me, I felt like was a matter of a creative drive, frustration, 
boredom, come to terms with being like becoming an adult, you know, like trying to understand how my body worked, all of these things that were happening, I didn't see those as geographically specific feelings. So why do you have to move to New York to have them? The other thing was I was in high school. I'm not moving to New York. Yeah. So do we have to wait? Do we have to wait to graduate before we can start doing things? Fuck that. So we decided we would just go ahead and make our own scene. And we weren't going to be a scene that was going to move to New York. That was not the plan. Not that people moved to New York are wrong. It's just literally that our concept was, well, we can't move. We're all in high school. But we want to have punk shows. We want to be in, we want to do, we want to play music. We want to create a, a you know, a tribe. Like a, we want an extended family. So we did it. But it wasn't, there was no DIY. It was n- do it or not. Yep. <clears throat> so it wasn't this idea of like an option, like, well, we could do it this way or that way. It was like, if you're going to do it, this is the only way to do it, which is form your own bands, put on your own shows, write your own songs, put out your own fanzines, put out your own fucking records. People say, why did you decide to do your own label? When the Teen Idols broke up in 1980, you know, we've been together for a little less than a year, maybe a year. We played maybe 40 shows or something. And our biggest audience was like opening for the, we opened for the cramps once and there was maybe a thousand people. I don't know. And we weren't that great a band. Like we're, you know, we liked ourselves, but so which label was interested in putting out the record of a defunct teenage punk band from Washington, D.C. that was okay? There's none. But we saw it as something that was important to us. And we didn't really give a fuck about the commercial, whether it was commercially viable or not. It didn't matter to us. What mattered to us was documentation. So <clears throat> again, it was not an option. So it's the art of necessity. It's not, it wasn't a, 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 cho- a choosing. So having said that, this have to, I have to tell you that in my life, going back to when I was a little kid, I would just, I was entrepreneur, weirdly entrepreneurial, but not because I wanted to make money. I just yeah. like the idea of having like businesses because it gave people something to do. So I had like a comic book shop and a bike repair shop and a, you know, and some of them were kind of scams. Like I would just, you know, let the air out of kids' tires and then charge them to fix it, you know, that kind of thing. But I was charging them a quarter, you know, it wasn't yeah. like a. Do you think any of that would have come from how you were raised or was it just like something inherent in you that, that drove that? Both. Both. It's funny. I was re- <clears throat> there's a there's a series of books when I was a kid. There's a there's a thing called the Three Investigators. It was Alfred Hitch- Hitchcock presents. It's kind of a do you know the Hardy Boys? I do. I, I remember the Hardy Boys. They were like an investigative kids, if right. I remember correctly. Yeah. So this is sort of like a kind of a B level version of that. I love these books. I love them, and these kids. They had their headquarters. One of the kids, uh, aunt and uncle, owned a junkyard. And in the junkyard, there was a, underneath a mound of crap, there was a, a like a camper, like a trailer kind of thing that was buried. And they had made it their headquarters. And they were always coming up with ways to f- use what was available to solve like these mysteries or these crimes. And I love that shit. So I think that I've just, that's the way I've, you know, I, I've always just done that. Like, okay, well, what's available? I mean, I was thinking about the song, in my threat, I wrote a line that says, make do with what you have. I wasn't joking. And I'm still not joking about that. It's just to where I come from. So yes, I think I was raised. I think actually that was kind of an American ethic early on. They got really subsumed. I was talking to somebody about this not that long ago, that in the early early 1900s i mean the core american value was like thriftiness and like can do and making you know making this piece of string last you know that kind of stuff but it's not good for business literally not good for business because the way the american business model you know it's about making people buy things over and over and over and over again string that lasts isn't profitable in the long run of course not right I mean, it's like the De Beers diamond people, they ran into big problems because their 
there was a catchphrase, diamonds are forever. Mm-hmm. Well, if diamonds are forever, then you can just give your diamond to your kid and then they don't have to buy one. And the amount of people who are buying diamonds, there weren't that many. So then they're like, oh shit, we need to. So they start introducing other introducing other ways to buy diamonds or you sell diamonds. They, it's just about the way the marketplace works. So I think that that was an American ethic that got shifted a lot, I think in the 50s probably, around that time. But I still have that, I, you know. And so I think that all these things, it's just, to, I, yes, it's the way I was raised. It's also just the way I am. I should also point out in the mid-70s, you know, we were skateboarders. You know, that's how I first met Henry, Henry Rollins, who at the time was Henry Garfield. I was 11 and he was 12. And then we became like, we started skateboarding together and we became pretty inseparable as skateboarders. And we formed a skateboard team called Team Sahara with a bunch of other kids from DC. It never occurred to us that there's the teams are organized by businesses. This, there's some business that organizes a team and you're on the team and you're getting, there's some consideration, like you're getting a little bit of money or you're getting some free gear or something. We formed a team like a street gang and we bought these black and gold jerseys. They didn't have any words on them. They're just black and gold, but they were just like our identifying mark. And then we'd go to like these contests. I wasn't a good skater. Henry's pretty good. But we'd go to these contests and compete. And the kids out in the suburbs are like, who are you people? I'm right. We're Team Sahara. And they said, well, who sponsors you? It never even occurred to us to be sponsored. Yeah. So I think that will show you, it gives you another, it's like an insight to the way my mind works, where it's just like, just do it, make it happen. And then see, you know, and, and yes, on the one hand, we were not a great skateboard team. Most of the people on the team didn't even really skate anymore. It was just a few of us that were going out. But it's almost 50 years later, and I'm still thinking, you know, it still has an effect. So yep. I feel like when you do something and for the reason of, but the purpose is to create, then you created something. Absolutely. I, I mean, I, I feel like similar to you in, I was primarily started in, in the, in the music world, in the, the punk pop punk kind of hardcore scenes in Jersey in the mid to late nineties was where I found it. And it was so influential to me when I saw kids who were like 16, 17, 18 in the bands, the ones with zines, the one, you know, where you see a, a kid who's 17 and he's got a record label and you're going, yeah. what? I, you know, before that exposure, I just had no idea that that was even really a thing that could be done. Even right. though similar to you, I remember my, my parents would buy a big bag of candy and I'd be out in front of the house trying to sell it for, you right. know, 10 cents a piece or whatever. Right. But that, that, that mindset, I just hadn't discovered. And it was, it was, I mean, it's informed my life 25 years later, you know? Yeah. And I think that I, I and, and I mean, I've never changed like my, I still, it's funny. I, people often say like, so you're in the music business. I go, I guess <laughs> just like, I mean, I've always maintained that I started a label because the music business is so odious, you know, like that's why we do it because to try to, it'd be like you go out and there's like fast food joints everywhere, but you still want to, have some food and you want to create food that's good for like you feel like it's just at least honest and not bad for you then we so we opened a little tiny restaurant but does that mean we're in the in the restaurant business i don't know because the restaurant business if it's all chipotle and whoever mcdonald's and all those people that's a different kind of business i mean they're they're i say the the record business business like they're sort of formal business is tragically not about music and sadly i think a lot of the punk independent so-called whatever a lot of those labels actually have been oddly have like focused more on the business structures of those majors and they also are not about music anymore because it just becomes about product it's a shame it's a real shame to me because I think that my thing was always, I've always felt like, just don't do it like that. I mean, we still, you know, I still never, I don't never use a single contract and I don't have a lawyer. 
So, and it's 41 years. I mean, I will say this. I do the work. And it's one of the reasons that things move so slowly. So, because I, I'm literally, things are waiting for me to get done. I mean, people like, you know, took us however many months to do this conversation. God, just, I'm just doing shit all the time. Now, you asked earlier, you were talking about you know, when you get your end of the day, when you're done with your work and then you kind of turn your attention to your sort of creative work, but it's all one thing for me. Yeah. My work is my work is my work. I tell people I don't have a full-time job. I have an all-time job. <laughs> Having this conversation with you is the same as writing a song or filling an order. Yeah. It's all one thing. I wake up every day with too much to do that I want to do. Absolutely. So I feel like, all right, I'm in good shape. Well, kind of, kind of going off of that, how, I guess in your experience through, through playing music, through running the label, like how important I found one of the most <gasps> important traits in, in the creative world or the arts is just to be persistent, you know, and, and just Nation. really persevere. I mean, how, how important have you found that to be in, in your experience? If I wasn't persistent, would I know that I'm not being persistent or would I, or is there, is there a degree of tenacity that like this one more tenacity, have more tenaciousness than the other? I don't, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I do think that I'm, I am, I'm a pretty persistent person, but not because I'm stubborn and trying to bull my way through things. It's just literally, it's just how I, it's what I do. And I'm not thinking about, and I don't think I roll over people. And there's plenty of people who are like, yeah, it's cool what you do, but we have the other ways we want to do it. Salute, go do your thing. I have a lot, a lot, a lot of friends who put out amazing records on massive labels who do things very differently than me. And I salute them. Everybody has to decide for themselves what's right for him or her. My point was never to give people a blueprint for how they should behave, but rather to make it clear that their hands could draw a blueprint. Yeah. That's the point. It's not that I'm doing it. Like I'm responding to my circumstances. So people say like, well, but if you are starting now, let's say you are 17 now in 2022, you think you'd still be able to do what you did? Well, sure, I do think that. But the circumstances are different. So I don't think a kid mimicking, like for instance, a kid who's 17 now, there what things were like in 1979 is very different. Yeah. Um, so I think it would if a kid was just to emulate me exactly now, then it would be surreal, you know, because it's it wouldn't make any sense. The same way. I have to think that if I was, I'm just assuming that if I was 17 now, that I would survey the situation and I would respond accordingly. It's just my nature, creative response. I mean, it's a hypothetical question. Sure. Would well, you think you could do it? Of course, I think you could do it. Always. Yeah. Because I mean, you can. Yeah. I, I would even say on a, on a, small level, you know, I mentioned it very briefly before we started, but that was where this podcast even came from was, was me looking for a thing and not finding it and going like, you know, taking that old DIY focus or whatever and going, well, I'm just, I, I can figure it out. You know, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to get a microphone and I'm going to figure out how to record things and how to edit them. And, and, and kind of like where you said, you want to show someone that their hand can make the blueprint. Right. I, I say I don't want people to use my blueprint. I want them to recognize that they can draw their own blueprint. Exactly. Exactly. That's all. I mean, and it's interesting. In some ways, and this is in retrospect, I had this is something that came up not, many years ago, actually, but someone pointed it out, and I was really struck by it. It's actually funny. It's HR from the bad brains. I heard an interview with him. This is maybe 25 years ago. And in the interview, 
the person asked him something about me because could I of course knew HR when he was in DC and you know we were super he's just you know super inspirational figure for me so when they said you know what do you know about like what do you do you have any thoughts about Ian or whatever the question was my ears perked up I've never hear HR discuss his impressions of me or whatever and I was so curious and he said something to the effect that Ian has created an island for himself. And then people point at the island and say, look, it's an island that only Ian can be on. And that was a really very heavy sort of um, observation on his part that I think the point he was making was that people didn't feel like they had to do things because I already had done it. And they're like, and also that they couldn't do it, that I had some weird superpower that allowed me to do it, but they, it didn't necessarily mean they were going to. So in some ways he was, I think he might be right that it in some ways either made people feel like they couldn't do it or it kind of made, gave them a pass because somebody else was taking care of it. Not that I ever had an agenda to begin with, but I didn't. I was just working on what's in front of me. I certainly was not my motivation was was certainly not to discourage people from wanting to to do things sort of independently, whatever, or with a, with a different approach. I think you know. I think he might be right. I think there there are people who say, well, yeah, you can do that. Or, you know, I remember people say like, well, yeah, Fugazi could do that or Meyer Threat could do that. But, you know, that's you guys. And it's really interesting because the whole point was, look, any of us could do it. That was the reason we did it was yep. to prove that it could be done. And we each can have an individual path to wherever right. we want to be. So I think that it's interesting that that people somehow it became like a supernatural quality when it, for us, the whole point was, look, it's possible. Anything is possible here, but that's just, I don't know what to make any of that, but it's all, it's all, and it can't affect that's behind me. So whatever, I mean, I've just done the work I've done. That's it. Is there anything that you want to talk about or, or like a, a, a plug, anything that you're doing? No. Okay. I don't plug things. <laughs> I answer questions. All right. Thank you, Ian, so much for coming on with me today. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much for listening today. Please subscribe to the Artist Work Ethic Podcast anywhere you listen to podcasts, and please rate and review the show. Follow us on Instagram at The Artist's Work Ethic, and check out theartistsworkethic.com.